I guess we'll get started. Um, hey everyone, and welcome to Dome Talk. Uh, I'm Aaron, and I'll be moderating this talk and posting helpful links in chat. Uh, we'll focus on the questions that came in before the meeting, and then we'll try to do our best to get to any questions you ask in chat. Uh, we try to stick to one hour, but uh, typically we go over, so I completely understand if you need to leave early. Uh, for those who haven't been here for, before, I'll start with a short intro on who we are. Uh, Natural Spaces Domes is owned and operated by Dennis Johnson and Tessa Hill. Located in North Branch, Minnesota, we have a dome complex consisting of an, an office dome, three model dome homes, a screen porch dome, two workshop domes, and the mini dome, which is our option for small living spaces. Uh, as always, we invite you to join us for an in-person tour. Uh, Natural Spaces Domes are healthy, or sorry, are, 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 are special because they're designed to be easy to build, full, healthy, energy efficient living spaces while still providing you the best housing value around. Our staff consists of 14 people with Dennis, Tessa, and Derek leading the organization. Uh, Dennis is the dome Guru. He has decades of experience as a designer, contractor, and builder. Having designed over 1,200 domes worldwide, he knows what works and what doesn't. His patented dome connector system is the best available and sees to it that everyone, that someone is there to help you with every step of your dome dream. Uh, next, we have our project manager, Derek Miller. He joined the NSD team several years ago, bringing with him a lifetime of construction experience. He handles a wide variety of responsibilities from collaborating with Dennis on projects and client contact to helping the shops refine build techniques. While he is deeply familiar with the dome construction process from the ground up, he is also our video guy, filming and creating educational videos, virtual classes, tours, and that kind of thing. And then we're also joined by Josh today. He's our shop and projects manager. He came to us with a combination of work experience in construction, remodeling, and shipping management. And he oversees the production of shipping, production and shipping of your dome, as well as inventory and purchasing. So uh, Derek and Josh, you wanna say hi real quick? Hi everybody. Hi, everybody. Cool. Um, and with that, uh, I guess let's get on to our first question. Um, first we have uh, Sarah in Maine. Um, who just asked, are domes prone to leaking? Pretty uh, general question, but one that we get fairly often. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think domes really kind of started out on uh, on a on the wrong foot, so to say, because in the beginning when domes became very popular, there was um, a lot of mom and pop companies that. We're trying to jump into a business that was exploding at the time. And because it was a do-it-yourself kit, um, a lot of people with little to no building experience uh, thought, great, I can buy this home for a fraction of the cost of a conventional house and I can build it myself and uh, comes in a kit and I can just, anybody can put it together. And uh, I think that is what resulted in a lot of the early domes having a lot of problems. Um, it was a combination of um, people that probably shouldn't have been building building as well as people, uh, a lot of dome companies that haven't figured a lot of the, the, the problems out yet, you know, when it was brand new. A uh, similar thing happened with structurally insulated panel buildings or SIPs uh, construction. Uh, the first uh, generation of those had a lot of issues too, which they worked out the bugs and, and domes are the same way. I would say the first uh, 10 years, there was a lot of rocky starts with a lot of dome companies, a lot of do-it-yourselfers, but I think all the problems got worked out probably by the 80s and definitely by the 90s. And today they're just rock solid. There's no issues with them. Um, there are, you know, some maintenance that has to be done on a dome that might be a little unique compared to a conventional house, mostly with the triangle skylights and stuff. But other than that, they're pretty much you know, just as, as solid and sturdy and, and leak free as any other conventional structure out there. Um, you probably have something to jump in there too, Josh. I didn't mean to take that whole thing, but. Oh, no, that was great. I, I was just going to add that, uh, you know, you have, you have the same risk that you, that you have with a conventional home and it just comes down to uh, having a good install and uh, working with good people. So. Right. 
Yeah, because domes are still available as kits. So there are still a lot of people um, that do build their own homes. And that's very, very cool aspect of the geodesic dome, um, being able to buy a kit like that. But um, as buildings get higher and higher performing, there's more and more details that have to be followed. And so if you miss those, you could still have problems. Uh, conventional home, dome home, barn, anything you build, if you miss a detail, you could still have problems with leaks or water vapor related problems. So yeah, so yeah, that's good. That's a good point to bring up there, Josh. Still has to get done correctly. <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay, we have our... Uh... Next question from Ed. He actually has a couple questions here that were submitted. So we'll go down. Uh, the first one here is, uh, it says he wants a staircase that is outside of the dome circle. Uh, what kind of structure will I need to contain the staircase that connects the main and upper floors? And can extensions be located between the pentagons or just under the pentagons? I want to start with that one, Josh, and I'll kind of jump sure. in on it. Um, so to put a staircase outside of the dome, um, I think you would just add a conventional extension um, to that that has has there in there. I think we have a picture with uh, the owner's home here, Dennis's home. Uh, so this is his extension to the front of his house. This is the inside view at the top of the staircase, just kind of showing. And you can see uh, that light pine edge going up around, that is the edge of the dome frame there. So everything to the left of that is gonna be the extension carrying that staircase and the little um, storage. It's a laundry room and underneath there, I think. Yeah. Yeah. You put yeah, a lot so, of mm -hmm. good, right? Yeah. And uh, there's, and no reason you couldn't put the extension in in between the pens. There's nothing to stop you. You, you just are more limited to how wide the extension is going to be, you know, for the opening before you have to start um, putting in uh, ways to support the load. So, yeah, like our typical extension removes two wall units. Um, and in this case, in this dome that uh, is on the screen, there is a total, um, on a full dome, there's 20 wall sections, uh, riser walls, we call them, that sit below the dome. And so if you open up two and you want one next to it, you got to have at least one wall section in between. So in this case, you could put even six extension openings in here, um, as long as you have a wall in between them. So the smaller the frequency of the dome, like a two frequency, you can only have three extensions. A three frequency, you can have five, but as you get larger and larger, as long as you can put a wall section in between the openings, you can do it. And there are times where we open up three wall sections for larger openings, like in this case, or in uh, uh, like if you have a garage dome, we often will do that. So, um, but yeah, the Pentagon is not going to really limit where your extension goes. It's a nice spot to put one, especially on a three frequency dome, which is probably the most popular frequency of domes. Um, you often will see them in between the pants or directly underneath the pant because it just kind of works out that way, but uh, it does not have to be, so. Cool. Um, and then uh, to moving on to his other question here, he says he likes the look of a uh, four frequency 712th uh, sphere dome, um, but it's not listed as an option on our site. So can that be done? Well, it, it has been done, um, but we don't like doing it because it's uh, it's a lot of work and uh, it doesn't technically support itself that way. So what ends up happening is, is, is it has to get supported kind of a row above that bottom row of triangles at the equator. Um, and then you have to get special uh, brackets made like these here to support that, that structure then at that point, once it comes in upon itself, you need additional uh, engineering, um, you need brackets and it's a lot, it's a lot more money, a lot, a lot more time and a lot more headaches dealing with a lot of uh, these aspects to make it come together. So it's not impossible, but it's uh, not recommended. Yeah, it, it's usually a cost prohibitive option, uh, typically. 
Um, and again, you know, not that the dome maybe can't handle the stress. It's just more uh, for engineers to sign off on it. Um, it becomes mathematical acrobats and they, um, they don't really like that. So if you're building somewhere where you don't necessarily need it, or in this case, it's a very small dome as well. So there's a lot of structure and strength in a very small um, amount of space. So it can, it's not a huge burden on each member. So, um, but yeah, we, we don't do it. So, and we don't recommend it. This is a unique project here. Yeah. This is, this is a unique one. And uh, then the actual dome, like, so it goes down, like, and it kind of comes in on itself a lot, but as they were saying, it's supported further up. So it's actually um, supported, like the floor is much higher than the bottom of the dome that's coming in. So yeah, this is a unique project with unique components um, that, uh, you know, we wouldn't recommend it for your actual house. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, I think that was mostly set up to be like a meditation kind of room and you know, so a small space and a very unique project, it kind of works great. But yeah, for a house, uh, building departments would pretty much require engineering. And then that's where you're going to run into problem. Engineers would want to see, they don't, you know, once it starts to bulge out and it comes in, then they feel like, how is that structure going to support itself? Because then it, it really amplifies where the loads get isolated. So it's a tricky one. So. Yeah. Cool. Ed, thanks for the questions. Yeah. Um, okay, next we have, uh, let's see, George and in, in Boston, uh, thoughts on a square or rectangular basement? Um, <laughs> underneath the dome, I don't recommend it. I think you should have, uh, a basement that follows the structure of the dome. Um, and just like any other house, you know, you're going to want it to be on top of a foundation that supports it, um, around the entire perimeter so um. yeah it, you know if you had a spot that came out for an extension or you you know you, it's not that you can't break away from the dome shape it's just like josh said te technically the whole kind of original premise to the foundation is to secure your dome to the ground and get below frost heaves if that's a problem or whatever it is you're doing so if you don't follow the dome, the dome has to get connected to a platform on top of the basement, which then has to get connected to the basement and all has to be structural. And so, so yeah, the best and most typical way is just to follow the dome or the house, any conventional house, just follow the perimeter of it. So. Well, there, uh, thanks, George. So our next question, let's see here. Um, just a simple note, uh, it's like Roger and uh, wanted to check on the uh, the dates for the Dome Tour. The Dome Tour is is October 5th this year. So if anyone's interested in seeing a whole bunch of our domes, um, as well as some other local domes, uh, you can go on our website and uh, pretty soon and sign up. We're still working on some details, but that is uh, October 5th. It's more like a open house kind of thing. Um, okay, so the next question is uh, from Mike in Texas. Uh, what's the increase of stats of the Mega Mini if ordered at the end of the year? What would be the ETA for delivery? So uh, the Mega Mini, I think that only came about because we started talking about it during Dome Talk a little bit. But um, last I heard about it, uh, this is not something we actually want to do. I think that project had some hiccups not related to us. But going forward, I don't think that's something that we're trying to 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 do. Yeah, mm -hmm. at least in the two frequencies. So the the mini dome that um, anybody's familiar with now that's familiar with the mini dome is a two frequency dome, and the mega mini dome was a little bit of a bigger size than our typical larger size. And and the reason we kind of limit the sizes where we do is then you have to start putting structure in for the triangle panels. You kind of exceed the span ratings of it. So I think what Dennis would rather do rather than make a large frequency is maybe make a larger, uh, a larger mini dome, but it'd be a three frequency dome. So then essentially it's going to be subdivided into more triangles. So each triangle is a little smaller than you can enlarge it. Um, so it may be a 36 uh, based on the 36 foot or the 40 foot diameter three frequency dome. Um, so that would probably put it if it was a 40 foot diameter dome at almost double the square footage of the current mini dome 
the 36 foot diameter would be kind of in between the 40 and the 29. So, um, so, you know, you're probably going to end up on one of the domes close to, you know, somewhere between 800 to, yeah, probably about 800 to, yeah, probably around 800 feet, I guess. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I'm like kind of getting both of them in my brain at the same time. But the bigger one would probably be around 800 or so. And then the smaller one might be around 650 to 700. Just kind of a real quick estimate. Um, and we haven't actually designed it yet. So it's been in the works for a couple of years because we had a lot of interest in it. And the gentleman that kind of was inspiring us to do the Mega Mini Dome just wanted a little bit larger than the uh, current mini dome. So we thought, well, we can do a 32 foot diameter instead of a 29, but it really starts to incur additional work with the uh, framing and stuff. And we just really believe that going to a three frequency would solve a lot of that. So, yeah. Yep. Cool. Uh, thank you for the question there, Mike. Um, so next up we have, uh, David in California. Uh, he's trying to uh, coordinate like delivery of the dome shell and try to get that close to um, good construction build date. Um, like what, what, what would you say is the uh, estimated wait time from like the deposit to you know get the project uh, going with the construction to you know delivery on site for like a average you know 36 foot dome. Hmm. That is a good question. That one, Josh? Um, I mean, that's just highly, I, I feel like it's hard to give an exact quote on the time for that because it's just so dependent on a lot of things for your drawing schedule. I mean, it's, um, it's a lot of things that could take the drawing schedule longer. Um, but once you're, once you've approved of your drawings um, and your construction drawings, it's, you know, once we can fit you into production, it's like five to seven weeks roughly um, to get to that production stage. I feel like it, I mean, it could take you, I mean, it depends. If you pick a straightforward plan, you might be able to sneak in um, within six months and get into production or something. Um, it's, yeah. I, you know, I wish I could say more accurately, but if, yeah. you know. It's a really custom how, job. It might be like a year or something. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of the wild part is the designing part and the drawings of the domes currently. It's also a little bit of our bottleneck at the company because we've just had such an influx of customers. Um, and Dennis has been trying to handle all of them uh, along with uh, David, our CAD drafter's help. And so they are kind of getting caught up. We're getting some uh, some additional help, but... The drawings, like Josh said, that's really the wild card. It could be six months. It could be a year, maybe, if there's a lot of back and forth with changes and adjustments. Um, but yeah, I think you're right, Josh. Once the drawings are done and you guys are like, our plans are done, we got a building permit, we're ready to get the dome. Um, that's very consistently, probably maybe six to eight weeks. It really like, kind of depends sometimes on the lead time of our vendors. So if you're getting Marvin windows through us, sometimes they're a six week lead time and that might just dictate the entire project. So, yep. so if you came to us and said, Hey, I don't, uh, I already have a full set of plans and a permit. How fast can I get this? It, hypothetically, it could be six to eight weeks, depending on our current queue of customers as well. Like right now, I know Josh is juggling, maybe three projects all simultaneously. So obviously, you know, you would have to kind of get in line behind them, but, but normally if you've already been in the drawing process, we're kind of ready. So as soon as the drawings are done, we can get you in production right away if you, if that's what you wanted. So. Yeah, it's certainly you can sneak into production within two months, you'd be in there, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of juggling because there's things that change in everybody's uh, timelines all the time. Like, you know, you you swear you're going to get a foundation in three weeks and it ends up being eight weeks or, you know, and then I might be able to sneak a project in in front of that now. Or, you know, there's just little things that change all the time. So. Yeah. Um, cool. Uh, David, thanks for the question. Um, next one is just uh, from, uh, let's see here, Bonita in south carolina i'd like to purchase design services how do i do that um i think that's pretty straightforward i mean you can go to, onto our website and go to the consultation request uh links and uh, or any of the contact links um 
you can fill out forms and you can get that to us. And then we'll contact you back regarding setting up, you know, short consultation, see what it is that you're trying to do. And um, then we'll just take it from there. I mean, there's no, I'd say like uh stamped out template for how projects go here because they vary so much in scope and scale and details. So um, yeah, just send us a uh, email or fill out one of those request forms and we'll get back to you. Uh, okay. Yep. Yep. We have, uh, this one is uh, Bill from uh, Michigan. Um, said, I would like to build a two-story dome. Is either the high profile or the mid profile Good for this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. Both of them could be good for it, um, depending on the size range. So like a high profile um, would be best for a 30 to 40 foot range. Um, for the mid profiles, you're probably going to want to go up to the 42 to 50, 59 foot range. So. Yeah, the, uh, the, the high profile is a little higher than half of the diameter for height. So you get more height in a smaller diameter dome uh, than you would in the mid. But by the time you get to the mid profile, since it's larger, it gives you some height. So that, that picture Aaron had earlier, if you remember with the extension opening, looking into the larger dome, you can see there's plenty of second floor uh, room there and head, head room there. And that was a 49 foot mid profile. So, but if you wanted to go smaller, then that's where the high profile helps because it's a little bit taller than half the diameter where the mid profile is just the height is half the diameter plus your riser wall, which is usually going to be between two and three feet roughly. So, um, but yeah, two story for sure. The only one in fact that it's really not that good for would be a small, uh, like a 30 foot, 30 foot diameter, um, low profile, for instance, wouldn't give you very little space upstairs. Uh, even a 40 foot, Low profile yeah. can actually give you a pretty decent uh, amount of room upstairs. So it just depends on how much you needed. But yeah, definitely what you're asking about is ideal for yeah. upper floor. I mean, like a 40 footer, if it's only got a 20 foot height, you know, you're you're also you got a one foot thick floor probably or something. And then, you know, you're looking at nine foot, you know, heights for each level or something, you know, roughly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At the peak, yeah. The yep. of course comes down around the top, so that's that's where you know, you can play with things like riser wall heights or you know mm -hmm. profile or you know how I guess if if you want a nine foot floor on the bottom or not. Yeah, that's a good call. That's, that's a nice nice thing about the dome tour is it gives you a chance to get inside some of these domes, and you can you know we don't have a, a large low profile dome uh home setup on our property but we do have the shop dome uh so like uh one of the shops where they build the skylights is a 40 foot low profile and you can kind of get an idea of how much there could be in an upper floor it's hard to visualize when it's not a house but at our complex there's a little sampling of all the sizes and frequencies and profiles so you kind of get a chance to see it all but during dome tour, then there's a lot of additional domes on there. And so if you really had your heart set on something or you something in mind, it's a good opportunity to kind of really actually walk through it and see what it would be like and how much room you have up there. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, Bill, thanks for the question. Um, let's see. And then we have, uh, let's see, Derek from Minnesota, spelled differently uh, uh, than our Derek. Uh, Basic rundown of mini dome information and assembly with a basement <clears throat> and a rundown on roofing ideas. Also, the total square feet of spray foam for the structure. That's, so kind of some general questions there, I guess, on uh, what it's like putting up a mini dome and how basements work. And um, yeah, do, you, do we have the, the math handy on the total square footage of spray foam? <laughs> You know, it, it's uh, it's uh, it's really going to be project by project because obviously, if you have a lot of a lot of large windows in, those wouldn't be square footage where you have spray foam. But typically, mini dome, you're probably two, which are the vertical walls below the dome. You're going to be right around a thousand, maybe a little bit more for square footage, um, as far as spray foam goes. You know, the front of the mini dome is almost all glass you got usually people put patio doors in there and some real big windows but um for instance we did have a, 
a gentleman build one in Arizona where he was facing south and didn't want a lot of large windows. So in his case, he probably would have needed 100 more square feet than somebody maybe in Minnesota where they're trying to maximize their views and their solar heat gain and everything in the winter. So, so yeah, it really depends, but about 1,000 square feet roughly. And then, uh, you know, the way they, they price spray foam is typically one square foot, one inch thick. So in the mini dome, the dome shell, typically if you didn't do a super wall, mini dome is going to be seven and a quarter inches thick. So you could get about seven inches of foam in there times a thousand square feet. So that's kind of the way if you're getting a price from a foam spraying person. Last time I heard it was about a buck 35 uh, a square foot for one inch thick. So that would kind of help maybe get you started <laughs> yeah. on that. So it varies tremendously though, place to place, of course. Um, but it, whatever you do, you want to go with closed cell foam too. I guess I should say that um, unless you're somewhere maybe like Arizona or somewhere where it's extremely dry and water vapor is really not something you got to worry about. But almost anywhere with the exception of a desert climate, you're going to want closed cell foam to kind of separate your heated space from your cooled space where the water could condense on something. Uh, this The closed cell spray foam kind of doesn't let the water vapor go through it uh like open cell does so yeah um i don't know if uh derek is on the line tonight uh to maybe give some more clarification for what he meant by like assembly with a basement or anything like that uh derek are, are you here you join up hmm. uh, doesn't look like it okay so yeah we probably need some more details for what he's as in mind for like roofing ideas and things like that yeah. roofing is yeah. roofing I mean, so we can, like things you want to know about we can maybe answer that so, so this is helpful too derek is it really it's all going to be very similar to a conventional house so the roofing is going to be kind of the same materials as a, a conventional house would be same with your foundation typically uh, the only thing different for those guys is maybe instead of 90 degree corners you have 12 or 19 degree corners depending on what you're doing um, so, you know, the mini dome is 36 degree corners, I guess, but basically it's all the same kind of stuff as all the other houses built out there. The only thing special about a dome is the connection hardware where the struts come together for the roof assembly and the triangle skylights or the custom made skylights. Everything else is pretty much the same everyday run of the mill stuff you can get at Home Depot. So. I mean, there's a lot of different stuff on, uh, on this picture, but I mean, it's still just shingles over here on the left yeah. side of course but, and that's something to think about you know it's what do you want from your products you know the shingles are a good 50 year product um you know so if you're going to be there for if you're like 20 years old 30 years old you're going to be there forever you maybe you want to get uh the metal shingles and you're never going to have to worry about it the rest of your life or you know or if you're not worried about it but either i mean both products are good these malarkey shingles are great that we rec we use here and we recommend for the domes um and then these metal shingles here are ranky shakes which is a, a company out in nebraska that we've been working with for uh, a very long time so uh, they're very familiar with domes and in fact they have them all over their website so you know that they're uh, promoting them for their use there um, and then you want to think about your underlayments too for how you know how long your your roof is going to be lasting you um those metal shingles you need to have uh, a high heat rating for them for the underlayments so you, you it's more expensive because you're getting like a grace ice and water ultra um but then again it's like a longer product life and uh you know it's just a lot of things to to think about yeah, you know? okay. That I can go into uh, da Davin's question here from Duluth, Minnesota. He was a bit down the line here, but he asked, how do I get the most out of my roof? Um, alternate, alternate materials and practices. And from what I've read, ventilation is very important. So I guess while we're on the topic of roofing, um, yeah, uh, what uh, would you say on you know, longevity and the specific practices that should be followed and uh well, like ever present topic of to ventilate or not to ventilate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, like Josh kind of was alluding to 
earlier, I mean, you kind of get what you pay for. So the Ranky shakes are going to be about three times the cost of like a premium asphalt shingle. Um, by the time you include the premium underlayment for them. And the labor is also going to be uh, more time consuming. So if you're doing it yourself, it'll take you more time. If you're hiring out, it's going to cost more for labor. Um, but then you have durable and extremely long lasting. And so it's, it's really kind of like if it works with your budget and you're one of those people that are like, hey, I want to do it once. I want to do it right. Never have to come back to it. Uh, rankings are hard to beat as far as a good roofing option for domes. Um, but the asphalt shingles are so good now, like Josh said, you get 50 years out of them and that's a long time before you got to worry about, uh, messing with it again. And if you're like Dennis, he's got domes that have 25 and 30 year shingles on them that are almost 40 years old and they're still on the dome and they're still working perfectly fine. Cause he's got a lot of tree coverage. So the sun's not, you know, beating on them all the time. So, so you may even get 60 plus years out of some of these real good shingles, depending on where you're at. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but um, I'm sorry, what was the other part of that question, Aaron? Well, uh, for the longevity and stuff, it's really, I mean, no matter what, whether you get a 50 year product or you get, you know, like a lifetime product, like those metal, the Rankies, Ranky Shakes, uh, it's going to come down to just installation practices, following the right procedures, uh, flashing things properly and following the proper overlapping pattern for the dome triangles. Um, so I think, uh, if you're in the process of redoing your roof, I highly recommend buying our roofing manual off our website. Read that uh, yourself. Give it to your contractor um, and have them look it over. That way you can make sure you know what they should be doing. So if you see anything wrong, you can point it out and get them to follow the right practice or fix it. You know, um, just be proactive. This is your house. It's not their house, you know. Uh, you, you want to make sure they do a good job. Yep. Yep. Um, and then uh, the topic of ventilation. Now, uh, oh, yeah, Evans in Duluth, so, you know, he's working with with uh, that climate. Uh, and, of course, this this varies greatly depending on where you are and all kinds, all, all kinds of things. But um, I guess what's what's a what's a uh, dis distilled version of that answer? Yeah, that's a tough answer to distill because ventilation is dictated partially on climate zone, partially on, on the insulation type you are you prefer. Um, there's quite a few factors in there, but but I, I guess generically speaking, um, the way people really used to like to do it, especially up in the Midwest and northern part of the country, is they used to like to ventilate the structure. And that just allowed drying underneath the structure. It kind of helped with condensation related issues and stuff. Um, with some of the newer materials that are coming out, a lot of people are starting to switch to a hot roof, which is non-ventilated uh, with closed cell spray foam. Again, if you're in the Midwest or Minnesota, you don't want closed cell versus open cell. Um, however, that is a premium cost and it still comes with some animosity with it because uh, closed cell foam is not, revealer of any kind of problem. So if there's the tiniest leak, uh, for instance, in a, in a dome with fiberglass insulation that is ventilated, you'll see a little dripping and you can usually fix it. It's like, oh, uh, you know, when the guy put the satellite dish up there, the leg bolt went through and a little leak came through, I fixed it with a little caulking, no problem, I can move on with my life. Where in spray foam, it doesn't really reveal that there's any kind of problem until it's really done some damage because the foam will let the water through, It'll just slowly keep leaking and rotting wood until it's a big enough problem that then you would notice it without having to see the water. So, so some people are a little nervous to use spray foam or it's just a premium option for expense. So, uh, so the ventilated dome, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. In fact, uh, Dennis's dome, Bear Creek, uh, on the property there is ventilated and, uh, you know, there's really no disadvantage to it other than typically, Ventilated dome shells will just have to be a little bit thicker because you're going to want to air space and you're probably going to have all fiberglass for insulation. Um, what's been popular with us lately has been what we call a hybrid method, which is to use try to get the best of both worlds where we use some closed cell spray foam to get past a certain point, I'll call it like a dew point within the wall cavity, and then 
go from fiberglass from that point on. And what that does is it eliminates the need for the vapor barrier, which is one another advantage of the closed cell foam. Um, but instead, you're not paying all your R value in closed cell at a premium cost. You're kind of trying to get what you need for closed cell to eliminate the vapor barrier and then fill in the rest of the R value with fiberglass. And in Duluth, for instance, it'd be about 50% of your total R value would have to be closed cell spray foam, 50% fiberglass. But if it was 100% fiberglass or any kind of vapor open material and had it ventilated, um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, you know, so... Yeah. In fact, at our on our complex, I believe all of our domes are ventilated domes. Of course, they're older and uh, the foam wasn't near as good as it is today. Um, so the hot roof and the non-ventilated structures, conventional houses, domes and everything else are becoming more popular. So. Yeah. Uh, so looks like, Davin, you are in the room. So, I mean, does that answer your question? Is there any other uh, details you're looking for? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Um, I found you guys on Facebook. Um, I, of course, did my research after I bought the house, right? So um, I ended up buying a house and I'm like, dude, this place is awesome. This is the coolest thing ever. Um, and they disclose that there's some roof repair that's going to be needed. And uh, so that's where the question kind of comes from. And then after I found your guys' chat, then I seen you guys have a really cool website. And then I found the, the roofing guide too. Um, so I appreciate that. I'm definitely going to going to get that but yeah um appreciate the feedback and um i was curious do you guys offer like any kind of like on property consultations or anything like that i'm up in duluth um wasn't sure if that's something you guys offer sometimes yeah sometimes we can we've been really busy so it's been hard for us to break away to do that but sometimes we'll do like inspections and stuff like that yeah. uh and then up on an hourly kind of basis you know we'll have so much per hour and then there's transportation but typically mm -hmm. unless it's something really specific to a dome um you could probably save some money to get like a local person to come and check it out and if yeah. it's something that's not really really unique it, you know you wouldn't necessarily need our expertise unless like i said it's very specific to the dome itself or something but yeah. but since you're in duluth i've gone up there myself a couple different times to you know check out projects for people so it is something we can often do but you know it's going to cost yeah. a little bit more to have us come up there than somebody local so and if it's just roofing stuff any roofer should should know what they're doing on a dome roof there's really nothing different other than just that overlapping pattern which is i mean you can see it and know what you have to do um sure. but so it might not be in, in your best interest to pay us unless there's like a real real yeah. issue but yeah. yeah i was and of course i go on the internet and i'm looking up like how to what's up with dome roofs you know and everything everybody's like ah. I was like, I'm like <laughs> no it can't be too crazy you know this is pretty cool but yeah so i got a few spots where i actually got the it looks like the sheet the sheeting itself is starting to sag on the shaded mm -hmm. side so i'm yep. guessing i got some pretty big repair ahead of me um that's gonna have to happen you know it, that happens a lot and, and more odds are very good that you probably have like osb underneath the shingles you know like oh that's so. a type of material versus plywood and that's kind of notorious for dimpling in like that where it'll kind of dimple in and structurally speaking a lot of times um other than cosmetically it's not too bad but obviously if that dimpling was caused by condensation from the inside condensing on that panel and getting it wet on the one side and it kind of softens and OSB likes to hold onto water. It's, we like to use plywood because it's a little more resilient if it does get wet. Where OSB kind of like when it gets wet, it takes a long time for it to dry out and it's just not structurally the same as like plywood. Yeah. So it kind of, you know, it doesn't on. hold its shape as well once it gets wet as compared to plywood. Right. Yeah. So, and it doesn't last, it doesn't have as long as a, a lifespan either. So that's a, another thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was a time where they built a lot of domes and there is, uh, they built so many domes, especially in Minnesota. There's a place that used to make plywood that was actually eight foot wide, well, not plywood, but OSB is eight feet wide by 28 feet long. And so they just cut one big triangle out of there where we use a tongue and groove and, you know, cause we can't get one big piece out of a, out of a four by eight sheet of plywood. But, but some of it was only a half inch thick, you know, or, five eighths inch thick so it's pretty 
thin considering sometimes the size of the triangle is covering so you know again just those early days where they're like boy these things are so strong they don't need any more than this and it's like well they don't structurally but what happens 20 30 years later especially if there's a little bit of moisture and that's what happens you get that dimpling effect so yeah okay. pretty common on older domes you know especially especially with the osb so yeah we, we were looking at a dome not too long ago that uh the roof was getting torn off and and uh someone just like stepped right through the osb on the roof one of the roofers did and uh they wanted to replace it with half inch osb again and uh yeah we convinced the owner that it was worth it to go with actual three quarter inch plywood for his roof um because yeah for all the reasons that derek mentioned so yeah it's pretty common for people to want to do that um but uh it's just better to go with the plywood if you can afford oh. them that's right oh yep cool well thanks for hopping on it's nice to be able to talk to talk to people too sometimes so appreciate that yeah yeah, I appreciate you guys answering my question. No Did we get them all? I know we kind of uh, were jumping around there, but I think we got it all. So. Yeah, thanks. Cool. cool. Devin, thanks for the questions. Uh, let's see. Next. Oh, just one more. If you did feel like you wanted like some uh, guidance from us or something, you could always kind of send some photos and stuff, and we can kind of review it from here and maybe save some costs of travel uh, just to do an inspection or something too. Sure. So we, okay. we can kind of gain, gleam a lot of information off of just, just photos and stuff. And mm -hmm. then I guess too, um, do you guys have any recommended roofing companies in uh, where you guys are at or anything like that? Or should I be too concerned about just hiring anybody or? I mean, uh, uh, oh, you can go. Oh. I mean, we we do have a guy locally. His name's Dan Newcomb. Um, phenomenal roofer. In fact, almost all he does is domes. Um, but he's very hard to really lock down into the schedule. He's so busy. Sure. Um, so if you're looking for something this year, I don't know if he could even do it. He might be able to come out and do an inspection for you, though. Uh, he's extremely knowledgeable and very good guy. So we could definitely get you his contact information. But the way he says it, he actually does our roofing segment at our dome school. And the way he tells the you know customers that are here at our dome school, he says, any good roofer can do this perfectly fine. You know, you don't need a dome specialist or anything. Um, he says that as long, as long as they can reference the dome manual, where they hit a spot where it's kind of unique on a dome, because the dome's not that complicated, but there's a couple of things that are unique. And as long as they got the manual, the reference, like, oh, I see how they take care of this one detail. He basically says then they'll be fine so according to him any good roofer can do a perfectly good job yep. on a dome roof but yep. um we can definitely get his contact information for you um yep. you could even email us or give us a call we can get it for you if you wanted to give him a call and just see if he could help you out because he would be my first choice but he's just yep. so busy it's hard to lock him down so yeah yeah and, I, and i'll admit to um going on the internet and googling all all this stuff too that kind of made me a little intimidated <laughs> at first i was like oh yeah i'll tackle that sure heck yeah let's go for it you know i love a project you know um yeah and then i did some reading i'm like oh boy <laughs> but uh no i'm gonna get that yeah. manual and, and really dig into it and, and check it out and yeah yeah and it really it it's if you did any kind of roofing at all or even a roof like helped on a roof yeah. It's really not that hard to do a dome. The The only thing about it, I shouldn't say it's not hard. It's just not complex. You know, it's not a, it doesn't take like all this additional training. It's just a lot of extra work of cutting shingles and, you know, mm -hmm. figuring out how to deal with the ladders, with the curve structure and stuff like that. That's mm -hmm. really your biggest challenge. It's not so much that it's so complicated that it takes a, a master roofer to do it correctly. Um, a, somebody that's really has tiny amounts of experience can still do it correctly. If they follow the manual, it's just, it is a good amount of work because each triangle, you almost treat like its own mini roof, you know, and then some will overlap and then they get trimmed. And so you just spend a little more time doing it. It probably takes about three times as much time as like just a conventional roof that you just, you know, it's just one big square and you just mm -hmm. kind of go, go, go. And then you go and do the other side of it. It's going to be a lot quicker than yeah. something that requires all those kind of overlaps and cuts and, but it's yeah. not complicated. So. Sure. Well, that, that makes me feel better. Cause yeah, I, I have definitely done some remodels and then helped a couple friends roof their houses. Um, so that, that makes me feel a little better. Okay. Yeah. 
Cool. Cool. Yeah. Nice. So once once you get into it, it's it's not bad. So it's just time, time and moving ladders a lot. So <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Cool. Well, thanks again. Um and uh let's see. Next question we have, I think Derek, so we might have answered this last time, but Tanya and Forest oh. Lake right down the street here. Um, so yep. she recently purchased a dome, and there are three levels with three different climates in in the dome. Uh, she said she's read that they're very efficient, but she doesn't really know how to get that ventilation working properly and how to operate things. Um, so yeah, any sort of uh, advice on ventilation or what to look for? I, th I think people have said that she, this dome was renovated too, so maybe that's mm -hmm. something to do with the the ventilation situation. It 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 could be. I mean, here. Uh, yeah, because I'm not. I know I answered it last month, so if she's not in, I won't go real deep into it. Um, I'm not seeing her, but this um, is a little like specific to her situation with her dome and her no. Yeah, it, it really is, and and from my if I remember correctly from last month's meeting. Um, she said that they have a HVAC system. So it's like a forced air system, uh, kind of like what you would traditionally think in a home where it's got a furnace or air conditioning unit. And then there's a ductwork system that distributes all the air and returns air and stuff. I think you got a good picture, uh, Aaron, of the forest dome with the return air on there. Um, if you put a ducted forced air system into any house or dome or anything um, and you don't do it right, it's hard to stabilize all the air temperatures on different floors, different rooms. Um, if you look at this picture Aaron just brought up, you see this is uh, this dome was built almost 50 years ago. So back then, you know, the domes are efficient. They just put a little window AC up in the top of the cupola there to cool the entire dome. That's all you needed. But if you follow that extension cord going down, you'll see there's a little kind of, uh, it looks like a vent uh, right in the rock structure there. Um, that's the intake vent. And it's, it's nice to have one of those in the upper part of your dome if you're gonna do a forced air system because uh, the dome will kind of wanna naturally circulate air anyway, just by the shape of it. And so sometimes just a ceiling fan will really stabilize the whole dome. But if you got something towards the top and something towards the bottom, where you're bringing some air in and you're putting air out, you just kind of create this, this loop of uh, airflow and it just keeps everything basically the same temperature. Uh, like in Bear Creek Dome, they have in-floor heat, so it's not a forced air, but with the concrete slab being warmed, all floors are the same temperature throughout the dome. I don't even think they vary one degree upstairs, up by the loft area, down on the bottom. But if you had a forced air system in there, and the circulation of the air wasn't done properly, there might be warm spots and cool spots. And I think, unfortunately, that's what happened for, in Tanya's dome is whoever did the HVAC just didn't really do it correctly. Or, um, and speaking of uh, the gentleman in Duluth, I did go up to Duluth one time. There was an office building in a dome, and they were having a similar problem where the upstairs office was really hot. And I went there, and there was a big return air vent upstairs that came down through this uh just basically it was kind of like part of a closet and it came down through there and they cut a big hole in it <laughs> and put another big vent there and it wasn't pulling the air from up there it's pulling it from there so i went there and we just basically closed that off and then the filter looked like it was about seven years old i mean it was all impacted so i think that was probably more of the problem but we pulled out and changed the filter and that solved their problem so hopefully in tiny's case it's something real quick like that where maybe somebody made a modification that just cut off the airflow on one of the levels and it's allowing that level to get cold or hot or whatever um, but it's nothing really specific about a dome it was just probably the hvac system uh just wasn't installed correctly you can have the same thing happen on two-story houses uh conventional houses too where whenever you got that level in there it's real easy to get different temperatures if the system isn't balanced properly so and Forest Lake is so close. I think on her last month, we told her, you know, if it was real bad, we might be able to break away and, and even go take a look at it for her and see if it's something we could help her with. Yeah. But still good information, even if she isn't here. Like this is a, you know, 
things that people want to know about domes before they're getting into it. So yep. Yep. still a good question to have this month, either way. Oh, I meant so she could uh, elaborate more on if she was here, so we could be, because we missed her last time. I figured she was trying to double back in here. Be like, yeah. I'll, I'll make it to this one. <laughs> yeah, I think she jumped in at the end of the last one, because I do remember having that little conversation with her about the forest oh, air okay. system. Yeah, but I, I think because she, I think she was the first question we answered. And then she came into the chat. Oh, I yeah, thought, that might have been what it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, but so uh, we got a few more questions here. I think a couple of them might be kind of detailed. So uh, try to try to get these going. We have uh, Jeremiah, who's uh, in Australia or going to be in Australia soon, I believe. Um, he's asking how are the dome main support beams attached to helical piers since they are at angles and not squared like a conventional house or deck. The only solution I have conceived so far is to have typical connectors welded to the pier top plate or custom made brackets. And so that's kind of esoteric. So I kind of have some pictures here that, that might help kind of show the problem that he's trying to solve here. Um, Let's see, I'll do this one. And for those of you that don't know what helical piers are, they're essentially like a giant uh, screw that is installed into the ground. And typically what they do is they'll use like a skid steer um, or generically like a bobcat, something with hydraulics on the front, and they'll just drive it in like a corkscrew almost until it, re until it reaches a certain amount of resistance and then that means that the ground compaction is suitable for whatever, however many PSIs it needs to be able to support up above it. It's all engineered. And once they reach that point, they stop driving it. And now that pier is set. And when they install all these kind of uh, corkscrews or whatever, then they'll just put a laser up and they cut them all off at the right height. So they're all exactly the same height. Because some may go down six feet, some may go down seven, some may go down five. One might hit a big boulder at three feet. So they all go down until they hit that resistance and then they cut them all off so they're exactly the same height. So they all start out with just a steel post sticking up and you have to weld some kind of a bracket on there anyway. Usually they'll put it like a flat plate on there. But in the case of Jeremiah, um, he's kind of wondering what happens when they come together at a unique point. Uh, so here you can see they have like a flat plate welded on there. And uh, they put a shim under there. You can see when they cut it off, maybe they're a quarter inch low. So they put that yellow shim on. And in this and in this case, it's, it's kind of not really a dome corner. So it's not a good representation. This is like a center beam for the floor joist. But you can see they put the one angle on there too. So it's kind of being held, supporting the weight of that beam. But then this little piece of metal that they welded on at an angle um prevents it from being able to swing one way or the other as well so it's, it's, it's supporting the downforce and preventing it from being able Got to move shifting, yeah yep and so you can see really with the steel post once it's in place you just kind of weld on whatever you need to uh to do if you needed this kind of a bracket you just weld it in place and bolt it on and you're done uh if you're securing one of those unique corners um there's just a lot of ways to do it like one way dennis did it it wasn't a helical pier but it was a pier on beach dome um he basically had if you imagine like a large piece of angle iron almost where it had a spot that was horizontal and then it bent in a corner and it went vertical so it just kind of went like this and he had two of them so he put one on one side of the corner and one on the other side of the corner and attached them to that plate that went on top of the helical pier and then that way he could, you know, that's how he dealt with the corner. Um, in Jeremiah's case, every corner is the same, at least on the dome. So uh, so if he made one bracket and he wanted to weld it together and just make a single bracket instead of two like Dennis did, he could make one and then just duplicate it and fit all the corners around the, the dome. So it kind of makes it a little easy if he really wanted to just have one just clean detail. Um, but essentially, you're going to want like three legs going through that bracket holding in there um, and their structural legs because that's going to hold it down besides just the weight on it. But you also want uplift force. So like, let's say you are in a hurricane zone and you have massive amounts of winds that can get underneath your house and they want to lift and peel the house up. You need all that strength to kind of hold it down. So 
So it is a very strong, robust system, but but it's almost always going to be customized. Even on conventional houses, they're just going to kind of have a plate there, and then you just attach it however you need to attach it. So, yeah, and looking at this uh, picture here again, so um, so you can see here how since there weren't any custom brackets made, so that's kind of the uh, issue with, with this is it's attached only with with this so it's not probably doesn't have much uplift strength right so you'd want the uh a bracket on the corner that goes into um like a joist system right yeah that's going into that that triple two by right right so this and right you'd want, you'd want it to go in through the side of that yeah you want a bracket that goes into the side mm -hmm. on both sides as you're saying or just on one side and just really bolt that thing into the peer system at least one side yeah Yep. You you don't really need both, but you need one side because the weight comes down on it. So that's not really your attachment point. So then the side is really where you attach it. So all the weights on top of it and then the side just prevents it from being able to move forward, backwards, left and right. It stabilizes the whole thing. So and it's hard to say because I think this that was the dome in Iowa that actually got covered in Ranky Shakes. And he kind of put like a stonework around like a dry stack stone, if I remember correctly, around the foundation there to cover all the those helical piers, if that's the same dome. But we don't know if we are seeing a finished picture too. It might have been once he got the framework up, but then he might have put on plates. I don't really know what he did there, to be honest. So, yeah, I have a picture here somewhere. I might have to dig for a minute to find it. But yeah, he put up like, you know, just something to make it so you couldn't just look at the dome and see and see piers. Um, it looks much yeah. more. The, uh, if that's his, you kind of do like a blue ranky on the bottom, I think, uh, the riser walls, and then you did a silver ranky or a natural aluminum on the top, and it's kind of a sharp looking dome when it was all done. So, yeah, I usually have. Oh, I'm trying to find it here. It's usually it's in like I my picture right now yeah. because uh, yeah. they're really cool roof, basically. But uh, I think he has a a blog going where it's extremely detailed. If I remember correctly, I never got a chance to read it, but I want to say it was maybe even like 50 pages of details as he was building it. He really documented a lot of stuff. Wow. So uh, anybody else who's building a dome could kind of look at his blog and he's got a lot of detail in there on his experience and what he did and, and problems he solved and stuff. So it's kind of a neat, neat little thing. Yeah, I'll try to find some uh, links to that on our website and I'll put it in the chat here in, in a minute. Okay. Here. Okay. Looks like uh, our next question um, is one we get pretty pretty common. Kind of going back to the roofer question, you know, contract contractors familiar with dome construction, um, and it, for that I'll just say because it's usually a pretty pretty quick answer here because we don't have I mean we have you know Dan Newcomb that we like to use and like to recommend him, uh, but he's pretty booked out so and he doesn't like necessarily to travel around the whole country so. What we try to do is, you know, whenever someone has a successful dome project and and has uh, a contractor that they work with, we try to just see, hey, is that someone that's in that area? So if you're in a particular area, um, we might know someone, but uh, it's not something that we, you know, personally endorse uh, people in different areas, you know, except for Dan, because we just work so closely with him. Um, so it's kind of the thing uh, you just get a regular contractor and once they kind of know that things are pretty standard, um, you know, once they get past, you know, the scariness of it, it's, it really shouldn't be hard. It's not nothing that they can't do. Also, we have a lot of contractors come to our dome school. I can't remember how many we had this year, um, yeah. come to our dome school. It was like four, I think. Like half a dozen. Yeah. And that is a great, uh, a tool is to send your contractors to dome school. So they, they can get a on hands learning experience with our systems, you know. Um, I don't. There's nothing crazy that they shouldn't be able to do off the be, off the jump, but it's just anytime it's something that's out of somebody's kind of uh, comfort zone or familiar jobs, it's good to give them an idea of what they're doing so they don't feel like there's something they don't know. Because usually they do know the answer. They just feel like they want to double check. You know, it's just that little safety. Uh, net so it, it might um, also help with the bidding process if you're trying if he's trying to figure out how much it's going to cost him to do it you can come here it doesn't cost that much money be like oh that's not nearly as hard as i thought it was going to be and you know maybe it knocks the bid down a little bit too so you know all good things when you come to dome school and the food's great too 
That's right. That's right. You know, it's all about the food. Wow. Yep. Um, okay, so next question here uh, from Ken in Idaho. Um, given any thought to using uh, 3D construction, like, uh, for instance, he has uh, Apis Core, but like, you know, there's various, um, you know, 3D printed sort of home home things that are going on out there, like some like new techniques and things. Uh, you got anything to really to say about that? I have a few pictures lined up for kind of what he means in case anyone's curious. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the 3D printing is, I, I would say it's probably not where it needs to be to really do a great job with houses. Like Josh was commenting earlier, you're kind of restricted on certain choices of uh, like insulation and some of these things. Um, but I think it is, I think it's in the infant stages, but it's probably going to become, um, it could potentially someday be a very popular building method because, uh, you know, I know on small scale stuff, they've got it now where you could even, uh, if you were to expand upon this to like a large scale, you could even print the plumbing and the copper wires in the walls as you're printing it. You know, I mean, it's just the printers are becoming that that good now these printers you can see they're they're low resolution um and they they're probably they're just going to be a, a single material as far as i know so they're really just going to be kind of like a structural material is all they're doing and so it, it it does create some challenges and it solves others but i think it's it's a little early yet for domes but i think it's 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 a great idea i mean i think it could be a great idea for domes so I think that one he sent, I'm going to look at it real fast again. I didn't really have a chance to check it out too much. I think the one he sent, Dennis, I think, was saying is kind of that particular one was restricted to probably vertical walls rather than being able to um, have like an X axis as well as the Y axis simultaneously going. So you, you could be printing and curving in kind of like some of the images. Uh, yeah, Aaron just had they, did do, they did do a circle wall, but it's a straight vertical wall it's, it's not coming concaved up so yeah so mm -hmm. obviously this one was able to do it and i'm sure some are i think that particular one he had though written there i think it's more for like verticals but yeah so it's it's kind of cool but we don't have any personal experience with it in our company we haven't um dabbled with it at all other than you know just trying to kind of see what they're doing and learn a little bit but we have no actual experience with it yeah, it might, might be worth noting too that a lot of these structures that have these like really sort of new novel building techniques, they aren't a lot of times really for houses, right? They're some kind of, you know, structure used for, you know, enjoyment or as an office or something. But when it comes to when you what you really want for your house to be like a forever permanent structure, um, it really kind of changes what you want from your materials and and your goals there. So that's one reason I think we haven't really done much to, you know, consider ship trying over, you know, transitioning to something else completely because lumber does a really good job of building a house. It, it does. And then if you have a certain um, advanced technology, so to say, like maybe these 3D printers, well, then does the plumber who's done his job the way he's done it forever need a whole new skill set on how to deal with this new material and how to run his pipes and, and same with electricians and so it kind of creates a lot of challenges for all your contractors and subcontractors. And, um, um, but at the same time, it also removes a lot of limitations on the structure itself. So, I mean, it, it's, it's, yeah. it's bad like everything, but right now I think the, the bad might outweigh the good. Um, but I'm sure there'll be a day where the good will outweigh the bad. It's, I don't know if we're there yet. So no, when they do look like they're difficult to insulate and I believe like the plumbing, he said that would have to be pre-planned. You'd have to have the plumbing, going and then run it through the wall before they even start printing the wall you'd have to have that tube sit in there and then as the machine comes around and to the wall you'd have to pull it out and hold it in the right spot let it do layers and keep it there till it's dry enough to keep it from moving so um you know it's just a lot of challenging aspects that they i'm sure will improve on so but for now you know yeah yeah and they probably have some products to stub out certain things but but yeah yeah, we don't, I don't know. It'd be fun to go to one of those projects, though, and really, really get the details. I think on the uh, the build show, there's a, 
like a little webcast or whatever called the build show. And I think there is an episode where he went to somebody that built a few of them and really got into some of the details. So if you're interested in it, it's just called the build show. And if you put in the build show 3D printed houses, I think you could probably isolate that episode pretty easily. And I think it's like, it might even be like 15 or 20 minutes he spends with the guy who owns the 3D printing company that did it. And they just kind of walk through it and talk about all the features of it. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, looks like next on the list here, we have uh, Bill from Oregon. I kind of piggybacking on a previous question now, what needs to be done to get drawings for permits and, and how soon can you get your dome kit after you, you know, get the drawings and things like that. Um, I think one thing that's probably um, good to mention here about, you know, your permits and what kind of drawings you need is it matters incredibly where you are. Um, and then also making sure that you know what it is that you need for where you're building, because yeah. they, you, you, you might think all you need is a drawing on a napkin. And then once you give it to them, they're like, wait a minute, no, 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 no. We, you're, you're doing something different. Now we want full engineering drawings. And it's like, okay, that, that's a very different thing. And, and I think having, having that sort of back and forth because you, you, because it wasn't clear what you needed from the very beginning can really uh, add some time to your project. Um, but anyway, that's sort of something I was thinking about there. I think for a timeline, we're we're sitting at about two to three months um, from the start of the drawing phase until you'd have your construction drawings to submit for the building permit um, where needed. Um, yeah, and then so like Aaron touched on, you know, it it is good to have all your ducks in a row before even doing that you want to know if you need engineering uh for where you live in your county and city um before beforehand so you can get the ball moving rather than get the drawings and go to submit it and then come back and go oh actually i need engineering and now your timeline has been delayed you know so yeah um okay so uh yeah not a just matters on your project and where you are so, uh, Bill, thanks for the question. Uh, so we have uh, David in uh, Michigan says, one of the skylights has lost its seal and is fogging up on the inside. Is this something that I can fix? Probably not very easily yourself. The way they do it um, when they build any kind of double pane or triple pane window, any multiple pane window is they basically... Well, if it's high performing, they'll usually going to replace the air with argon gas. So you'll have these two panes. There'll be what they call spacer in between them so that it dictates how far they're spaced out. They'll put whatever kind of gas is in there for some kind of thermal advantage. And then typically they're going to have like a silica around it to keep, to dry out, suck up all the moisture in it. And then they put almost like a tar substance around the edge. And that really seals it up basically hermetically seals it so no water vapor whatsoever can get inside there. So once you get water vapor inside there, um, that means that that seal has failed. And uh, sometimes they last 50 years, sometimes they last 10 years, um, but for whatever reason, the seal failed. And now when the sun hits it or whatever, and it gets warm and the air expands, it pushes a little air out through that little hole or crack in the seal. And then when it cools down, it sucks air in and that allows it to bring water vapor in and gets foggy and condenses. Once that happens, uh, most people would say that glass unit is garbage because the only way to really fix it is to pull apart the two panes and redo that whole sealing process. And unless you're like a glass manufacturer with all the right equipment and everything, it's probably a little bit of a challenge to do. Not that it couldn't be done, it's just... I, I would say it's probably a challenge. I, I mean, yeah, yeah, it is. You know, I, I don't know if it's worth it even because I mean, I mean, the glass is expensive, but yeah, it it would be tough. So, in fact, I've never heard of anybody doing it. We had a customer that we did some work for, who was trying to preserve his um, old glass, and we put in some new frames for him, and we put in the old glass, and the seals were shot on it. And it was condensing and we tried on site the best we could to try to seal it up. It's very difficult to do because if you have even the smallest 
Um, if a hair follicle can fit anywhere around it through any part of that seal, that's all it takes and it, the seal is no, is no good. So it's hard to get it 100% airtight. And it's also under pressure because when the sun hits that air in there, that air expands and since it's sealed up, it actually can bully glass out a little bit or it can move in a little bit when it cools. So that it's always putting stress and strain on that seal, which is why eventually that seal fails is it's just always being pushed or pulled a tiny amount every single day, you know, as yeah. the, the temperature changes. So I think it's pretty tough to do on your own. Yeah, it seemed like when we've when we tried to fix his the seals for that customer, it really it just ended up keeping the unit as one piece, kept the glass pieces from pulling further apart. You know, it he probably still had moisture issues with that paint. Um, yeah. But yeah, you're forced to. I mean, your options are to just reorder the glass, and then um, if it is one of our skylights, it's not too bad to replace the glass in the existing frame if the frame's still good. We just take that top cap off of it. Uh, you take up, take that glass unit off, and you put new uh, tape sealant in and reinstall the top cap with some new screws. So here's a picture of kind of a diagram of how the skylights are done. So yeah, you can't replace the glass, so you can't fix the glass. Well, yes, I can't. But yeah, everything Derek said about the difficulty. But if you just need to replace the glass, if it's one of our skylights. Then that's where we can, as Josh is saying, we can pull off this piece here and then replace the glass and put it back on. And that's a pretty easy repair job. Doesn't require having to tear any part of your roof off or anything like that. So um, that's really not too bad of a job. Yeah, you're talking about like an hour or so, yeah. you know. It's... Yeah. And everything can be done from the outside. So it doesn't mess with anything on the inside. So, yep. Yep. And it's a rarity that it, it happens from damage. It's usually a seal. Uh, the glass we have is quarter inch tempered and it's extremely strong. Um, but, but those seals just, you know, they'll last sometimes, like I said, maybe in 50 years, but it's at some point in time, they're probably going to fail. Um, just because that seals always under pressure. So, yeah. So with that, it looks like we don't have any questions in chat. And that was all the ones we had um, submitted. Uh, anyone else uh, while we're here? I mean, it's 714. So uh, we were uh, under our usual uh, overage of 30 minutes. <laughs> under our overage? <laughs> yeah, under, under our, our typical. Um, so let's see. Is there any enough Alan Post saying he has a question or if he's just. Yeah, I have, a, I have a question. So do you guys use, I know you use probably fiberglass bats to insulate in the panels. Um, do you use hemp wool at all? Have you experimented with bats with hemp wool? Um, we have not. We're kind of waiting for somebody to do it and give us feedback on it. Um, we usually don't recommend anything until we've had the opportunity to feel confident it's going to be a good recommendation. We have had somebody do lamb's wool, which I had some experience with, and I thought that was a great product. Um, but you're you're right. Typically, we're just going to recommend the tried and true fiberglass batting. Uh, we do use Knopf, and it's a recycled glass, and it it doesn't have a lot of the um, chemicals in it. It's a little easier to work with and stuff. Um, but the hemp is becoming more popular, and and once it's, you know, you kind of want a product to be out there for a few years so you get the opportunity to really see. Because sometimes problems don't show up for a few years, maybe even ten years later, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh. First few years, it was great. And then we saw it started to have this issue. And then by like year eight, it was a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so we're kind of hoping a few people do it and just give us some feedback. And we we wait to see. Because I think optimistically, I think it's going to be a great product. So I think it'll start to be more common. But as of now, nobody, none of our customers have used it to give us any feedback. So. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, looks like no one else had anything for uh, for now. So uh, yeah, I guess with that, we will we'll, we'll call it. I'll say there's another uh, dome talk in the books. Um, yep, this this video should be uh, posted in a few days on our YouTube channel in case you want to see it again or uh, you want to show friends and family how cool our dome talk is. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, well, thanks, thank you, Aaron and Josh. Yeah, thank you guys. Well, we'll see you guys next time. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have Thank a great you. day. All right. Bye-bye.